Praise the Lord. Welcome to Church of Christ Union Church Bhubaneswar's YouTube channel COC Bhubaneswar. Let's listen to the message in English preached this week. We hope it will be a channel of blessing to you and a source of edification for your spiritual life. Let's listen to the message right now. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I thank God for uh, this opportunity to stand here and share the word after a long gap. And I thank God for making it possible. At the same time, uh, I thank the secretary and also the pulpit committee uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. You know, uh, whenever me and my wife, we come back to Orissa and to the church, my home church, that's it, my home church. It brings back a lot of uh, nostalgic memories and because uh, my association with the church started in 1965 when many of uh, our present uh, congregation, a youth group were definitely not born. And so it was the privilege of myself, Paresh Bhai and Binoy Bhai and all to grow up together. And I'm so happy to see you, Brother Binoy, present here. And um, we have all these memories, and I was in Capital High School initially in uh, those days. And then, of course, we have all gone different ways, but the relationship continues, and the memories are still there. You know, let me start with a small story. There were the, that is, a couple had uh, two little boys, ages 8 and 10, who were excessively mischievous. They were mischievous and the two were always getting into trouble and their parents could be, uh, could be assured that if any mischief happened in their small town, in the small town, that these two boys uh, uh, definitely would be involved. So the parents were at their wit's end and as to what to do was that their son's behavior and the mother had heard that a new pastor had come to town. And um, so he has been successful in disciplining children. And so she asked her husband, do you think that our, these two boys should go to the pastor? And the husband said, we might as well, because we need to do something before I really lose my temper. And so the pastor, maybe it is Sangram Singh, I don't know, agreed to speak with the boys. And, but asked her to see them individually. And the eight-year-old went to meet with him first. And the clergyman, the pastor, sat the boy down and asked him sternly, with a grave face, where is God? The boy made no response. And so the, so the pastor repeated the question in an um, even sterner tone, where is God? And uh, the boy made no attempt, because he thought that he is a Christian boy, you know, and so, so no attempt to answer. So the pastor raised his voice even more and shook his finger in the boy's face and said, where is God? So at that, the boy bolted from the room and ran directly home, slamming himself uh, in the closet and closed and his older brother followed him into the closet and asked what had happened. The younger, younger brother replied, we are in big trouble this time. God is missing and they think we did it. God is missing and they think that we are responsible, we did it. But we know that uh, God is not missing at all and he is always there. And it is we that shiver our relationship with him and say that he is not there. He is there. It is we who shiver the relationship because of various situations, reasons, our own desires, everything. And then we say that he is not there. And if that has happened with any one of us present here, I believe we can reestablish that relationship again this morning. We can reestablish the relationship because he is, uh, he is waiting and, and he will never uh, reject anyone. So 
if you give a title to my talk today, basing on the passage which has been read from 2 Kings, uh, it could be something like this, when having it all isn't enough. So I think it may come on the screen, when having it all, when having it all isn't enough. Having it all isn't enough. One of the most uh, familiar verses in the Bible is uh, John 3.16. And it tells that God so loved the world. So immediately we take a pause and that raises a question. If God loves the world, why there is so much of trouble? Why do we have coronavirus? Why there is disasters like the super cyclone, the devastating floods, the tsunami, and uh, earthquakes, etc. Why does God allow bitterness and hatred between nations? Why do we have terrorism and lust and greed? Why are some of our greatest minds employed in creating uh, armaments of destruction? Why? God so loved the world than why it is. And right now, as we all know, and the secretary and pastor have already mentioned, we are going through very challenging and uncertain time right now. And you and I, we do not know what is going to happen. Last night, uh, me and my wife, we came back from Manipur last night after doing some ministry there. And uh, on the 23rd, we are supposed to go back to US, USA for our work. Now we do not know whether that flight will go or not. We do not know that if we reach, we might be going through 14 days of quarantine period. And so we do not know. Uncertainties, which is going through right now. If we want to know about the troubles of the world, if we want to know about human history and about personal redemption, we have to come to the Bible. And here is our, this is our manual. This is our manual, our guide, and our map. Everything to all our situations and problems, everything that also we can, we will find here. So, recently, I read, I read an article which uh, uh, I just want to read briefly about that, that uh, well, this is what happened sometime back in America, that fire swept through the home of a family of six in the church, in one of the church. Although the father and son survived, the father was still hospitalized while his wife, mother, and two small children were laid to rest. Unfortunately, heartbreaking events like this continue to happen again and again. And when they are replayed, so is the age-old question. The age-old question comes to mind, why do bad things happen to good people? And it, it doesn't surprise us that this old question doesn't have any new answer. Because yet the truth that the psalmist puts forth in Psalm 46, and uh, it's also very, it's been replayed and rehearsed again and again. So Psalm, the pastor laid us in the sponsorship, uh, responsive reading of 91, which is an appropriate Psalm. And also, if we look to the few verses of, uh, of uh, Psalm 46, because this I'm saying because we were in a situation which has never happened. We have never faced something unusual is happening here and all over the world. But, but, as Psalm 46 also says, like 91, Psalm 46, God is our refuse and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And also, 
Then the, though the waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Then verse 7 onwards, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our, our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease and the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the seals with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Praise God. And that is our hope. And so here the writer tells about this, that uh, when we, the conditions described in the psalm, the conditions described in verses 2 and 3 are catastrophic. It is catastrophic. Earth and mountains moving in the sea water raging, and we shudder when we imagine being in the midst of the stormy conditions, poetically pictured here. We shudder, now also we shudder as we hear the news in all the channels and which says what is happening and we do not know, we do not know and we shudder, that's what is happening. But sometimes we do find ourselves there in the swirling throes of a terminal illness, tossed about by a devastating financial crisis, stung and stunned by the deaths of loved ones. It's tempting at that time, it's tempting to rationalize, it is tempting to rationalize that the presence of trouble means the absence of God. That's what it comes to mind. The presence of trouble means the absence of God. But the truth of the scripture counters such notions. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is present when our circumstances are unbearable and we find comfort in his character. He is good, loving, and trustworthy. That's the God that we trust and we serve. So as we, <clears throat> as we open the Bible, we need to ask, First of all, what is God like? And we are told that he is a God of holiness. He cannot look upon sin. His eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. The Bible also says that God is a God of judgment. It speaks of the wrath of God and of a day of judgment coming. One day, you and I will have to stand before God and give account to our words, our actions, and our motives. But the Bible also has something else wonderful to say about God. It tells that God is love. That God is love. Has you, have you ever imagined or wondered why God has placed you on this planet? And, and what our purpose is being here? It is because God is love. But... Because God created on this planet you and me, you and me, whom he sh we should love and in return also love him. He will love and return we will love him. But in order that we would not be like little puppets who would obey simply when he would pull a string, God gave us the freedom of choice. He has given us the freedom of choice which to choose. So... So in the paradise uh, he has created for man, there was initially, there was no war, no police force, no racial discrimination, no hunger, and no poverty. And God said, you can enjoy all the fruit of this garden except one tree. If you love me and obey me, you will, we will build a wonderful world together. But if you disobey and rebel, and if you eat the fruit of that tree, you will suffer and die. That you will see in Genesis uh, uh, 2, 16 and 17. To save time, I am not reading the verses. 
and in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So God stood back and see what man was going to do with his gift of freedom. It wasn't long before man deliberately rebelled against God. And that is where all our troubles began. Man began to suffer and die. And he began to know war and poverty and also and hate. We became alienated from the and separated from God. We, we inherit sin from our parents. That is true. We inherit sin from our parents, but when we reach the age of accountability, we ourselves choose to sin. And so, and so when we practice sin, that is what happens, we ourselves choose to sin, and then we practice sin. In other words, we are sinners by inheritance, we are sinners by choice, and we are sinners by practice. That's what happens. The Bible says that the result of sin or the wages of sin is death. That you'll find in Romans 6, 23. We are all under the sentence of death. But what kind of death? The Bible speaks of three different kinds of death. There is the physical death. And so every cemetery testifies to the fact that we are each appointed uh, to die. Death is the only certainty of life. So why should we bother? I mean, we should not be afraid. We should be careful. But that fear element should not be there. If Christ tarries within a hundred years, we will all be gone. You and I will all be gone. And that is the result of sin. Another death is called the spiritual death. Living inside our body is the soul, which was create, created in the image of God and was made for fellowship with God. Because of that, only God can satisfy the soul. Only God can satisfy our soul. We can make, we can make money. We can reach the pinnacle of popularity. We can... Uh, acquire great political power, we can reach for pleasure and beauty. But none of these things satisfy. None of them fulfill our lives because we remain spiritually dead. And so we have got enough example of top movie stars and singers. You know, they could not find any fulfillment and they commit suicide. It's, you know about that. And so that is because we become spiritually dead. And the third kind of death is the eternal death is taught in the Bible, and Jesus calls it the hell. We can have hell in this life by separation from God, but there is also the hell to come. Jesus used such language as lost, perished, condemned, or punishment, and fire. These words describe something terrible. They mean that when we die without God, we go into eternity still separated from him. That indeed is a terrible end. Let us look at an example from the life of Naaman, from the passage that has been read to us, and see what we can learn from this passage. So, we find <clears throat> that Naaman was a commander of the armies of Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his king and of the people. Syria, at this time, roughly around 845 BC, controlled a great deal of Middle East. And uh, Naaman was a brilliant soldier, a man of great courage, and also a conquering hero. He had it all, wealth, success, prestige. He had it all. But he also had leprosy. Of course, the leprosy was most probably was in a different form than we know, but even then, it was leprosy. In those days, leprosy was the most dreaded of all diseases in the world. It was incurable, and as the disease progressed, a sufferer 
could eventually be forced to live with other lepers in a place away from the society. He would be declared unclean and he would have to stay away from people and cry out when you walk, unclean, unclean. No one would come closer. That you will find in Leviticus chapter 13 verse 45. And leprosy would bring physical disfigurement, social rejection, mental depression, economic ruin, and eventually death. What? Physical disfigurement, social rejection, mental depression, economic ruin, and eventually death. Naaman was a successful man with everything to live for, but, but he was a leper. This but is the history of every one of us. The but is the history of every one of us. Now, Naaman is a picture of all of us. His leprosy is a picture of sin in our lives, a fatal condition that overshadows all successes and accomplishments and ends in death. And that shadow of death hangs over every one of us. Just as leprosy separated people from the society, remember this now, the comparison, just as leprosy separated people from society, the Bible teaches that sin separates us from God. The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 3, 23. We are all guilty of sin. We have a disease that's constantly eating away at us and has destroyed our relationship with God. That's the reason we can't find fulfillment in life. We try. I have gone through that, and all of us, we struggle with that, particularly the younger generation, and we find that uh, that's the reason we can't find that uh, fulfillment. That's the reason we can't find peace and joy and happiness in life. We search for it, but because of sin, we don't find the ultimate joy that happens. It is a medically established fact that leprosy works primarily as an anesthetic. As an anesthetic. It numbs the pain cells of the hands and the feet, nose, and eyes and ears. It numbs the pain cells. And with the warning system of pain gone, warning system gone, people literally wear away their extremities because they can no longer feel any pain. That's exactly the way sin works in our lives. The Bible says of being hardened by sin's deceitfulness in Hebrew 3.13. And in Roman 1.28, it says, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind, to what ought not to be done. That This is actually a very sad verse, that a time comes, the numbness, the numbness that leprosy prevails is the same thing also our sinful actions. Because what I told you, that we inherit sin, then we, then we become, then we practice sin ultimately. That, that happens with us. So because our senses become numbed. That's what was happening with the leprosy also. So that's why ultimately what happens in Romans 1.28 Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to return the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to, what, to do what uh, not to be done. That's the ultimate scenario that happens when our, uh, our senses are deadened. And after a while, after a while, we do not even think about sin anymore because it becomes a way of life. It becomes a way of life. We become completely numb to it. Our conscience no longer gives us any warning of the damage being done to our soul. The damage being done to our soul. The Bible wants us not to harden our hearts. 
But then, now come back to Naaman. But now there was one hopeful thing about Naaman. He realized his need. And amazingly, there was an answer for Naaman's leprosy. As you have read, there was a young captive Hebrew girl who served Naaman's wife. The girl said to Naaman's wife, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. We, I, you know, it, it struck me, the little girl, a slave, had the audacity, had the audacity to tell her mistress like as an evangelist there. He is, she is becoming a kind of evangelist and opening the door for, for Naaman's soul to be saved. And she told that. She had the courage to, to say that. So what we find, so after that, that Naaman decided to go to Samaria where the prophet lived. But he went the wrong place, the, in the wrong way. Instead of going to the prophet Elisha, he went to the king of Israel with a letter of introduction from his own king. And we read that, that the Israel king, poor fellow, he tore his cloth. Well, what do you think? Am I God? I can, I can clear, cure. So that's what also he did. And so he went, uh, introduction of letter, and along with great wealth. He brought millions of dollars and um, worth of things in order to buy his healing. So if we see that he, it was um, 340 kilos of silver, 70 kilos of gold, and 10, uh, 10 sets of clothing, all loaded. You can imagine the chariots being loaded with these things. And that he went, and he wanted to buy his healing with that. Naaman saw his need. He knew he was helpless, but Naaman had to be humbled and realize that God's cure was a free gift that could not be purchased or earned. In the same way, there is nothing that you can do to cure your disease of sin. You can't do enough good works to have your sin forgiven and get to heaven. We can come only through Jesus Christ, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2.18 And so what God requires is our faith only and repentance of our sin and uh, putting our total trust in Jesus Christ. But the thing is that many people miss it. Many people miss it because Naaman wanted to make it complicated. But, the, but here, what we find, the cure for leprosy could not be purchased for any amount of money. And the cure for sin cannot be purchased also by any amount of money or good work that you find in First Peter 1, 18, 9, 18 and 19. We must come to Christ in all humility at the cross, saying, O oh God, come into my heart, forgive me, cleanse me, and I commit myself to you. After Naaman left the king, he changed his attitude to, to some extent. A little bit of change, but not complete. This time, he went to the right place. He went to the right place, but he still went in the wrong way. So, Naaman went to the prophet Elisha's house, but he went with his horses and his chariots and his military power and his beautiful uniform. And... Uh, uh, he was like a dignitary arriving in a motorcade and he expected to be treated like an important person. People say, I will pay my way. God says, not by silver and gold. People say, I will perform good works. God says, it is all finished at the cross. There is nothing you can do to add to what Jesus did on the cross. People say, I am not a bad sort of person. God says, your righteousness is like filthy rags in my sight. I have, then people say, I have got plenty of time. Maybe when I get older, I will make a decision like this. But not now. God says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Maybe today, this moment, this time, could be a time for some of you that not to miss the opportunity. Because you never know. 
Eliza didn't even bother to come out of the house to meet Naaman. He told his servant, go out there and tell the general to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River and he will be healed. Naaman got angry. His pride was hurt. Here he is, the great general of the armies of Syria, and the prophet won't even come out to see him. Instead, he just sent, he just sent the word to dip seven times in Jordan River. You know, it was read, Jordan River was a muddy river. It is still muddy now. The Naaman said, aren't the rivers of Damascus better than the Jordan River? You see, he wanted to dictate the terms. He wanted to dictate terms. And you and I many times want to dictate terms to God. But God says, no, there's only one road. And it is the narrow road that leads to eternal life. And many may not find it. Many may not find it. That would be our, so what would be our choice? Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.8 The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But Naaman finally went to the river. His servants came to him and said, Sir, if he had asked you to do something difficult, go on a pilgrimage, walk for 100 kilometers, then, uh, then uh, take all this money, then you may have done it. But he told you a very simple thing, and to dip yourself, and it is humbling, of course, that get into that muddy Jordan River in this foreign country. But you ought to do it. So Naaman said, Naaman did it. He went down one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. He must be getting up from the water and looking at his body, what is happening. And but nothing changed, nothing changed, because he had to complete the thing which was told to him. And imagine he must have looked at his body and the leprosy was still there. And he must have been ready to give up, thinking that the whole thing was crazy. But finally, he went down the seventh time and when he arose, his skin was like that of a little child. And the leprosy had disappeared. God's plans for salvation, salvation looks foolish. But it is so simple, in simple and humble obedience to the word of God, Naaman became clean, as though he had never had leprosy. Similarly, when we come to Christ and be justified, it becomes as though we had never committed a sin. The story of the Syrian, of the Syrian general can be our story, could be your and mine story. What should be our decision? Shall we remain in the same spiritual condition as before? Or shall we, like Naaman, humble ourselves and find the healing? Shall we remain or humble ourselves and find the healing? We know that our life here in this world is very brief. The thought just came, more than 5,000 people in the world wide have left this world because of the coronavirus. So, they were, not, were they prepared? We don't know. Were they prepared? Where they went? We do not know. Similarly, we also cannot say what lies ahead for us. And um, so that, let us remember that life is God's gift to us. And what we do with our life is our gift to God. I repeat that, I like it very much. Let us remember that life is God's gift to us and what we do with our life is our gift to God. Let me conclude with a story. And uh, there was an, there's this old legend about three men who were crossing a desert on horseback at night. As they approached a dry creek bed, they heard a voice commanding them to dismount, pick up some pebbles, put them in their pockets and not look at them till the next morning. The men were promised that if they obeyed, they would be both glad and sad. They would be both glad and sad. After the deed, as they were told, the three mounted their horses and went on their way. And the first streak of dawn began to spread across the sky. The men reached into their pockets to pull out the pebbles. 
and to their great surprise, they had been transformed into diamonds, rubies, and other precious gems. It was then they realized the significance uh, of, uh, of what they heard. It is, that was what they heard. And they had picked up, so because they were happy that they had picked up as many pebbles as they did, but they were sorry, so sorry, that they had not collected more. They had not collected more. That was the opportunity for them to collect. I wonder if we will have the similar feelings when we go to heaven. We'll be happy for the treasures we laid up in heaven while on earth and, and uh, joyful for the rewards Christ will give us. But we will also experience regret for not having done more to serve him. For not having done more to serve him. There is so much to be done to take this good news to others. Let us make the most of our opportunities so that we will be more glad, we'll be more glad than we will be sad. And uh, so, so that is what, that is what we, we experience. And as we go through our life's journey, we will find that uh, things could happen. And uh, things could happen and we do not know the uncertainties of life. And let me conclude with Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. That would be the great reward as we reach. Let us make a decision today. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. We hope this message was a blessing to you. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel COC Bhuvneshwar and click on the bell icon to receive latest updates on the sermons preached at COC Bhuvneshwar. Thank you and be a channel of blessing to others. May you shine the light of Christ through your life.